Okay, well, hey everybody. Thank you so much for jumping in on our Garden Guest Series, the first one of February. And today we have a super interesting topic um, that all of us can utilize in our own backyards. And we have the wonderful Linda Merritt, a master gardener of Bradley County. She's been a member since 2013. Um, she is such a joy to work with, such a help, extremely knowledgeable. Um, she has a passion for pollinators um, and restoration of pollinator habitats, which of course we are going to uh, learn about right now, but I think we're ready to go. Thank you so much, Linda, for joining us today. Thank you for a great introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, so today we're going to talk about the monarch butterfly. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about is their numbers, uh, migration, um, and one of the things I'm going to touch on is the difference, because I think we're seeing a lot in the news lately about the Western monarch numbers, as opposed to the Eastern monarch number. They are two completely different groups of uh, migration uh, monarchs. So, And then we're going to talk about how you can help and how to raise them. Uh, one of the things, again, we've all heard that they're, of course, the monarch butterfly, their numbers have been dwindling quite a bit. Um, the Western monarch that's been in the news recently, their numbers are in critical decline, uh, mostly due to habitat loss, the wildfires out in California. Uh, their migration is basically from the coastal areas of California, almost to the Rockies and a little further north. So they don't cross over the Rockies, they stay on that side. So they're suffering quite a bit. Um, the Eastern Monarch numbers are down about 80% over the last 15 years. Um, these are the Monarchs on the Eastern side that migrate up from Mexico. Um, in, I'll be mostly, all of my references will be to the Eastern migration during this talk. Um, just to give you a couple of number of facts on this, um, in 2012 and 2015, their numbers really took a huge nosedive. Um, there were 682 million monarchs counted in their winter habitat um, in 1997. And in 2015, they were down to 42 million. So that's an, a tremendous loss in, in numbers. Um, they are coming in back since 2016. They have increased their numbers. The last count from 2019 to 2020 was 150 million over in their winter habitat. Um, so that's, that's are starting to come back. They are increasing, but they're not, sustain it's not a sustained increase meaning that they go or they're going up they're fluctuating up and down but there's they're not nose diving so that's that's a really good thing one of the bigger problems that they had in 2017 and 2018 was the drought problem in texas kind of wiped out a lot of the uh um milkweed pop milkweed plants and it, it really compromised their laying their eggs. Okay, so again, their, their numbers are declining, mainly due to habitat loss, fragmentation, meaning all these subdivisions are kind of blocking their pathways, and of course, overuse of pesticides. Um, and anyway, they're logging a lot of the pine, the, a lot of the trees that the monarchs overwinter in in Mexico, and that's dramatically decreasing some of their numbers. However, they're trying to stop that. There are some environmentalists in Mexico that are trying to take care of that problem. Um, there is hope for these guys. Uh, the Eastern, again, the Eastern Monarch, the Western Monarch, they're really trying to work on those numbers. Um, many organizations focused on conservation and education. National efforts of public and private landowners have been making a big difference too. Now, talking about their migration, the monarch butterfly does not make a complete migration, meaning the butterflies leaving Mexico, do, they're not the same butterflies that end up in the northern states and the lower part of Canada. Um, there's three to four generations during this migration. Um, when the overwintering monarchs return from Mexico around late March, they fly up 
I don't know, a third of the way, lay three to 500 eggs over two to five weeks. And after laying the eggs, those adults do not survive. Then the next group emerge, of emerging adults will continue their way up to the Northern states. Um, this map kind of shows where we're going. They start here in Mexico and they kind of kind of fan out. Um, we see them in our area, they go up through the Corn Belt and there's a few that go across the Appalachians, but not too many. And they, a lot of the overwintering or oversummering is occurring in uh, Michigan, the upper peninsula of Michigan and up in this area right here, seems to be where most of them hang out over the summer. The fall migration, um, they head back our way around late August, early September. Um, we'll start seeing them here kind of mid to late September. Um, the adults from this group of hatchlings will migrate back to Mexico. Um, the caterpillars that hatch out here in October, mid-October, those, the females of that batch are fertile and they will go, they're the finishing migration and they will end up back in Mexico. And when they come back, they're the ones that start the process all over again. So there's three to four generations of monarchs that make their way up and then make their way back. So, do we have, a, is, can we tell if they're female or male when we're looking at them in our garden? The one on the left is the female, the one on the right is the male. And it's kind of, the only way you can tell them apart are these two little dots right here. These indicate, so if you can see that when you're looking at them, you can tell whether you're looking at a male or a female. Okay, is it a monarch? Are we actually looking at a monarch? This on the left is a viceroy. And the one main way you can tell a viceroy from a monarch are these bars right here. These little bars right here are a clear indication that it's not a monarch. So that's one way to help identify when you're out, when you see them out in your garden. So caterpillars. I oftentimes get phone calls that there's monarchs on my parsley. No, those are going to be black swallowtail caterpillars. They're the ones that eat your parsley. The, the parsley is a host plant for the black swallowtail caterpillar. So they will lay their eggs on that. So if you notice the difference, they have similar markings that black and yellow and all that, but the, the monarch caterpillars have these antenna and they also have these long things on their back. It kind of throws off the predators, which end am I looking at? So that's, that's an interesting way to tell those apart. Okay, so how can we help them? Of course, we need to plant milkweed. Milkweed plants are the only plants that the monarchs will lay their eggs on. They will, lay their, they will not lay eggs on any other plant. And when we're looking at buying milkweed or, and planting, we need to be watchful for the tropicals. I have seen tropical milkweed being sold in the stores. Um, we need to watch out for that. Um, of course, limit, don't use pesticides. Um, we need to provide a variety of flowering plants for the adult butterflies, and we can help their survival rate by raising caterpillars. So native host plants. These are the top four native host plants in our area. There are several dozen native uh, milkweed in the country. These are particularly native to our area. Um, common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, which is this one here in the middle, uh, swamp milkweed, this pink one over here, and then we have white milkweed. Um, and if you're planting milkweed and it's the first year that they're gonna be coming up in your garden, get familiar with the baby plants. I've done this before where I think they're weeds and go to grab them. And the one surefire way to tell if it's a milkweed plant or not is to just pinch a little leaf and it'll have milk. It'll have a little dot of milk on it, and then you can know for sure what you've got. Okay, so tropical non-native milkweed. They can interfere with the migration and reproduction. Um, 
They grow later in the season, which confuses the butterfly and their breeding times. Uh, many of these tropical native, uh, tropical non-natives um, possibly can contain a protozoan parasite, um, Orphrocystis <laughs> electroscaera. <laughs> Um, and these, these tropicals also contain a higher concentration of cardon, cardonolide, which is actually the poison in the milkweed that the caterpillars eat, which helps them survive because the animals don't want to eat that stuff. So, but the problem is that the tropicals have a much higher concentration of this, which can be toxic to the caterpillars. So they need some, but too much can create toxic problems and actually uh, kill them. So again, when you're looking for milkweed plants at uh, box stores and, and other places like that, just double check the tag and see what you're looking at. Um, we have Asclepius curosavica. That is the tropical here on the left. This is our native tuberosa, just an example. So if you get to the store and you're looking at the milkweed and it's particularly colorful or you're not sure, look up the genus name and you'll be able to discover if it's a tropical or not, because that's really important to not buy those tropical milkweed plants, especially in this area. If you're living in Southern Florida, it's probably okay. So life stages. After the butterfly lays their eggs, they will hatch in about five to seven days, depending on the weather. And if it's a little cooler, the eggs will hang out for a while. If it's particularly warm, they may hatch a little sooner. Um, the caterpillars take about 14 days to reach chrysalis stage. The average survival rate in the wild is about 2%. And this is due to potentially lack of food and predators. And also often, you know, people don't know what they've got. You know, they can do pesticides or they're picking them off thinking they're hornworms or something like that. But typically the survival rate is due to lack of, there's not enough milkweed for the amount of eggs that they've laid, that the, that the butterfly has laid and predators. And there are several predators um, for that, ca that can get these caterpillars. Um, one of them, most common is the tachnid fly. And what that does is it will lay eggs on the caterpillar and then they hang out inside the caterpillar. And then when the caterpillar goes into a chrysalis stage, they don't survive that and they end up dying in that stage. It's kind of sad. Um, we all, there's also wasps, bronchnid wasps are, are also a predator and actually salamanders, some salamanders will eat them. So it's just a dog eat dog world out there. Okay, so here we have some milkweed that has the eggs on it. So you can kind of get an idea of what those look like. And some butterflies, they will lay three to 500 eggs and sometimes they lay them all on one plant. And sometimes they spread out the love. So it depends on how many milkweed plants you have. Again, problematically is that if you've only got 10 milkweed plants and you've got all of these eggs and the caterpillars, there's not going to be enough food for them, which is kind of unfortunate, but it's, it's, it happens. It happens. Okay, so here we have a monarch female laying eggs. And she will dance around and stop and dance around and stop on the on the milkweed. And of course, this is our one of our caterpillars. That I, this was taken in my garden. And this guy is actually getting ready to chrysalis up. He's on a mint plant. It's kind of why he's just hanging out there, because this is not milkweed. When they get ready to chrysalis up, they will crawl away and try and find another plant, preferably about three to five feet off the ground. Um, so oftentimes when I go out into my milkweed patch and I'm looking and I go out there and I've got, oh, I've got 50 caterpillars today and I'll go check on them a day or two later and they're all gone. 
Odds are pretty high, one of two things, predators or they've crawled off to go chrysalis up somewhere else. And then my grandson and I have a wonderful time walking around in the tall grass and in the shrubs nearby and some of the other taller plants trying to find the chrysalis to look at, to try and find them. So that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. So in order to attract these butterflies to your milkweed, plant diverse plants of different kinds of flowers to attract the adults and then they'll find your milkweed. And trust me, if you plant it, they'll find it. So raising monarch caterpillars. So what you need to do when you're gonna do this is collecting the caterpillars and the eggs, having a contained safe space for them, have a consistent source of fresh milkweed leaves, and have at least three weeks of time to care for them. And you can do this in the spring and the fall. I do both sets. And it's really important that if you're gonna commit to raising the caterpillars that you are available or you're gonna have to have someone come in and take care of them because they need to have fresh leaves given to them every day. Um, and the bigger they get, sometimes I have to give them leaves twice a day. So it's, it definitely is a commitment to do that. Okay, so collecting caterpillars and eggs. Collect the leaves that have eggs, like similar to the picture that I showed you. Just pinch the leaves off and you can bring those in. Collect the leaves that have caterpillars on them. Only bring in as many as you can provide for. So you're gonna have to kind of judge how much, how many caterpillars, how much milkweed, if you've got another source, a neighbor, a friend that's got a lot of milkweed, you can get fresh leaves for them. Uh, no more than 10 caterpillars in uh, about a 10 gallon tank. They do get, you know, an inch and a half, two inches long and they make a huge mess. So if you try to cram too many in one space, you're gonna end up with problems and then there's gonna be a food fight issue and so no more than 10 in a 10 gallon size tank for a size uh, reference. So you've gone out, you've collected your caterpillars or your eggs, carefully bring them into your prepared habitat, place leaves on the bottom of the cage. And I like to put a few twigs in the habitat at various angles because they like to crawl up and, and move around when they're in there. So that helps. Um, with them and then whatever habitat you choose, keep it outside in a protected area. Um, I keep mine on my screened in back porch. Um, it keeps them out of the heavy rain and wind, but it keeps them out in a temperate condition because you don't wanna bring them inside in the air conditioning. And, or in the fall, if you're turning your heat on, they need to be out in, in their natural environment and their temperature so they, they can do what they need to do. Um, temperature change has a dramatic effect on when they chrysalis up, when they emerge and all of these different things. So keeping, keeping them outside is the best, the best way to do that. Okay, so. These are some of the instar stages that you're gonna see on your milkweed when you're out uh, looking and trying to collect them. And the younger you can get them in, the better. Um, I usually let them hatch on my, in my garden and I'll bring them in and the newly hatched caterpillars are about the size of a grain of rice, maybe a little smaller. And then you can see the second, that's a couple of days, couple more days. When they start getting into this, to the bigger sizes, you can still bring them in, but you run the risk of them not surviving because they odds are high that they've been parasitized by them. And some of them aren't, but some of them are. And that's when you get into the possibility that they, they won't survive through their chrysalis stage. So try and get them in as young as possible. And you can even bring the eggs in and put them in the bottom of the cage and just wait for them to hatch. It's kind of cool to be able to, to kind of see that. And they grow pretty quickly. 
So that's kind of fun to watch. So caring for your caterpillars. Of course, we need to have a safe habitat that predators can't get into, that they can't escape. And they are little Houdinis. So if there's any little space opening, they will crawl up to the top. And I've had them in various places in my, in my uh, porch sometimes because I keep count of them and okay, there's two missing and I'll look around and find them crawling around somewhere else. So keep a tight lid on it. I put a screen over top of my tanks and just put clips around it to keep them secure. Again, you need to provide fresh leaves daily, which means going to your milkweed source, picking your leaves and bringing them in. Now, when you have tiny little caterpillars, bring in tiny little leaves. And as they get bigger, start bringing in bigger leaves for them because they will chow down on those things and they'll be gone in half a day. And then clean the cages needed, remove the dried uneaten leaves and the droppings. And these guys are little poop machines. So keeping the bottom clean is essential. Um, I learned the hard way that if you don't clean it, at least every other day, you'll end up attracting ants and flies, and then you've got a real problem. So try to keep that as clean as possible. Um, there are a number of different habitats that you can use. Um, you can, there's plenty online you can purchase. You can make one, just a nice size box out of one by ones, one by twos with some screen. Um, the one thing you need to make sure is that you can have access to this habitat, um, that you can get inside of it. Um, I like to have, I have the 10 gallon tank for some of them. And then I have a much bigger area that I made similar to this, this, this one. And there's no bottom on it. So I have it sitting on top of a table with newspaper. And when it's time to clean it, I can just pick the cage up, move it, clean it, and put it back on there. And of course, if you got caterpillars on the bottom of it, just kind of gently move them around, pick them up. It's okay to touch them, not too much, and, and take care of it that way. So I actually have three stages. I have a little baby, I have a little nursery, and then as they get a little bigger, I'll move them into a little bigger pen. And then as they start getting big, bigger, I'll move them again into another pen to give them room to start crawling around and exploring and looking for a place to start chrysalis, doing their chrysalis deal. So again, feeding, um, this is from one of my tanks and there's about six caterpillars in this picture and that's a full size leaf and they will have that eaten in about an hour. So hungry, hungry caterpillars. It's really amazing how much and how fast they'll eat. Okay, so we brought them in, taken care of them, and you go out one day and notice that they're hanging upside down, kind of looking like a question mark. They're getting ready to chrysalis up. And you can see right here that they've spun a little web to hang themselves from. And they will stay like this for sometimes up to 36 hours. Sometimes they only stay there for half a day. So could be 12 to 36 hours. They will just hang upside down like this in this question mark. And if you're really able to have the time and you can watch them, when they straighten up from this question mark, in a matter of seconds, they'll start to wiggle and then they'll turn their little skins inside out and that'll drop off, that'll shed off and blam, they're in their, their chrysalis. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And it literally takes seconds for that to happen. So if you, if you do this and you see that, consider yourself very lucky because it's, it's rare to catch that happening. Most of the time, because they're, such, they're so vulnerable during that period of time that they wait for them to feel safe. So if you're out there moving around, making noise, they're not gonna do it. So I have taken to stepping aside and kind of hiding, if you will, when I know they're getting ready to do this and I've been able to catch them doing it a few times. So it's really kind of, kind of interesting. So in their chrysalis stage, 
usually takes about 10 to 12 days for the cycle to complete. And this is the very first stage that you're going to see um, right after they chrysalis up. And several days later, it will appear as though the sheathing around them is thinning. It's actually just the butterfly forming and you can start seeing an outline and colors. And then by day eight, nine or so, then it will look like it's turning black, but it's actually changing. The metamorphosis is, is starting to finish up and you can really start to see the orange colors and the outlines of the wings and all that kind of good stuff. Now, between this stage and this stage, if you have one that turns completely black and you cannot see any orange at all, you've lost it. At that point, you've had a caterpillar that's been parasitized. And usually between the second stage and that third stage of metamorphosis is when they perish. So again, if you find one of these that's completely and totally black and there is no color at all, you've lost it. And if you're not sure, just wait and eventually it'll just shrivel up and start to get gross and then you'll know for sure that it's, it's not gonna make it. Um, and then the final stage is it looks very, very clear. Um, again, the more and more outlines are very, very clear and you can see most of the entire butterfly in there. So again, when they start to emerge or they're getting ready to emerge, the whole thing will start to move and bounce a little bit, very subtly. And if you notice that, just hang out for a few minutes because it takes, once they start doing that, it's about 10 to 15 minutes and they'll start to start to come out and it'll look like they'll just cracks. And they'll and then they they'll crawl come come out of it. Their wings are completely crinkled up. They're all smushed, and they'll hang upside down like this for a little while. And that takes about an hour or so for their wings to start unfolding and drying a little bit. And then they will get to this stage. And this is what I like to call the drip dry stage because once their wings get to this point and they're dry and completely, or they're unfolded, they're still very damp. And you'll notice little brown drips will start showing up underneath of the butterfly. And that's perfectly all right. That's normal, waiting for them to drip dry like that. Um, at this point, you wanna just leave them alone. Um, usually, I'm gonna say it's usually about three to four hours after they emerge. Um, hopefully they've emerged in the morning and then by the afternoon you can re let them go. Now I've had some that have, have emerged in the evening and I just leave them in there overnight and then release them in the next morning because I don't want to release them at night. Um, just didn't feel safe to me to do that. So I would keep them, keep them in the, in the pen overnight. And, uh, that would, that would be good for them. So. All right, now, when we get to releasing the monarchs, of course, after the drip dry time and they start moving around and you, they're opening and closing their wings, they're ready to go and move outside. Um, you can do this one of two ways. You can gently encourage them to climb up on your hand um, and take them outside to your garden where there's sunshine and plenty of flowers. Um, or you can take the cage out and open it up. Problematically is that when you start collecting the caterpillars, you're collecting them in different uh, age groups. So you're not going to have, they're not all going to hatch at the same time. You're going to end up with two or three. And then a few days later, you'll have two or three more. And a few days later, you'll have two or three more. Um, I've had caterpillars go, you know, in, in almost a two week span because um, I can't help myself. I keep bringing them inside <laughs> and then I end up prolonging the process. But um, so I just generally just get them on my finger and just take them outside and find a sunny spot and a flower and a stem and, and let them hang out. And eventually they fly off. 
good luck with your butterflies. It's, it's really kind of a rewarding process. And I was able to successfully release about 65 in the fall. And I was able to release last late spring, early summer, I was able to raise and successfully release about 45. So all told, I was able to release almost over 100 butterflies. Um, so that's really rewarding to do that kind of just, you know, helping, doing your little thing, helping them out. Um, and so I've got some resources for you if you're interested in doing some more and looking at, um, there's uh, the monarchwatch.org, um, the Federal Wildlife Service, and Xerces.org is a really good organization. They're doing a, a tremendous amount of work with uh, habitat restoration, uh, community organizations, working with different cities to uh, put plant um, milkweed in right of ways and community gardens and all that kind of stuff. Um, the National Wildlife Federation um, and two of the books, uh, Bringing, Bring Home the Butterflies, Volume 2, um, is a more recent book that's going to have a little more updated information in it. And The Monarch by Kylie Bommel is, is a very good informative book as well. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service ruled in December of 2020 that the monarchs deserve to be put on the protected list. However, it's probably not going to happen for a few more years. Um, and this is due to the fact that, unfortunately, there are several uh, animals and birds and other things that are in front of the monarchs that are even in more danger. And they have to look at those and assess and do studies and all of these different things. So it's kind of a slow process to get these guys on this list, um, but they are in line. So hopefully in the next few years, we can have the monarch be put on the protected list and then we can really start doing something with um, saving them because areas of land and milkweed and all that will also go along with them being a protected species. So we can keep our fingers crossed that that'll happen sooner than later. Very good, Linda. Appreciate you, you doing that today. Yeah. And we'll uh, thank you. And I'm sure there's going to be some questions. We'll answer those. There was yeah. one in the chat that said, how many milkweed plants should one plant in their yard? Okay. So I started with, I got I started mine from seed um, and I, I had about 15 plants in the beginning and I planted them in an area that was about 40, 50 square feet. In three years, I had hundreds of milkweed and they're running all over the place. So they will spread by root system underground and they will also spread by seed. So a word of caution, when you plant milkweed in a few years, be prepared that you're gonna have it everywhere. And it will show up 10 feet from the original plant sometimes. Now, if this is gonna be a problem, just you can dig and cut up the root and just move them back or plant them in a different area. But 15 plants spread to a hundred in, in about three seasons. Okay, what about water? Should you have a water source nearby or? Um, it depends on what type of milkweed you get. The swamp milkweed, hence the name, does need a little bit more moisture than, let's say, the rose milkweed or the white milkweed. So assess your area. Um, if you have a low-lying or damp area that stays damp, then we might want to go with the swamp milkweed. Um, the butterfly milkweed, that orange one that you see kind of growing on the roadside, that likes it dry and, and it does do well in clay. Uh, the, ro or the white milkweed, um, they like it a little more on the dry side and they'll do okay that way. So kind of make the assessment on what type of area you're planting in and then choose 
that type of milkweed for that area. I know I was trying to get some going here. Well, we do have some here at the Ag Center in our in our garden here at the Bonnie Oaks Garden. They're, and they're the butterfly weed, the orange. And every year we get quite a few aphids on there. That's the first thing we see. Wow, just tons of aphids. I haven't seen that many butterflies yet. And I don't know why, but we haven't gotten them that much. Well, the butterfly milkweed, they, they will lay on that, the eggs on that, if there's nothing else available. That's kind of like the potato chips of the milkweed group. <laughs> Um, they will lay eggs on it and the caterpillars will eat it. But if they have a choice, they're going to migrate to the regular milkweed instead of that, the orange with the thin leaves that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, they would, will, you, they will work with that, but they prefer the fatter, bigger milkweed leaves. Uh -huh. What is a local source of the plants? Where, where can they get the milkweed locally? Um, I have seen milkweed plants available at um, Elder's Ace Hardware. Um, they tend, they have the native milkweed at times. It doesn't last long, but they do have it. Um, I have seen the white milkweed. Occasionally, Lowe's and Home Depot will have that. Um, I have purchased uh, from um, some online native plant nurseries. Um, yeah, I know uh, Tennessee Naturescapes is an yeah. is they're up in Clinton. Yeah, uh, reflection they riding. Have, uh, Sandy Lust. Sandy Lust said that she knows reflection riding. Yeah, been. reflection riding. Yes. And, and actually the wild ones were, um, I don't know where they were getting their source, but they were actually either giving them away or selling them really at low, low price. That's Yeah, that I, maybe... I'm not sure their source, they may be growing them, actually. It's not difficult to grow them from seed. Mm -hmm. So um, they may actually be growing them that way. Yeah, I would encourage any master gardeners to yeah, start them and yeah. get them going in little pots and then you could give them away to people mm -hmm. who... Speaking yep. of pots, we have a question here. Would the milkweed do well in a container? I think it would do fine for a few seasons, um, but the original plants are going to die back and then they're going to want to spread out. Now, if they're in a container where they're just going to wrap around and pop back up, that probably would work, but it's not going to work long term, I don't believe, because they really, they need to spread out. And they're just, they're going to end up pot bound and root bound in there. So I'm not sure that they would do well long-term in pots. Mm, so maybe you could get like one or two seasons out of the milkweed if it was in a mm -hmm. container and then it would kind of yeah. not have enough space. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then speaking of um, longevity, how long do monarchs live? The, for, okay, monarch, monarchs only live about three weeks. Wow. Maybe six. And this is their migration period during their migration period, the third or fourth generation of migration that go end up at their summer, their summer beach house, if you will, um, they will last about nine to 12 weeks. That's that three months of summer or so. And then, then they start coming back when they start laying their eggs on their migration, their return. They, when they're finished laying their eggs, they perish. So depending on what part of the migration they're in, it could be three to five weeks, and then it could be nine to 12 weeks, depending on that. So they're not really that long lived. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And our next question is, does milkweed need to be planted in full sun? Yes. Any tips for growing? If you've got one plant that succeeded last year, look for five more popping up next year. They are slow to get started, but once they get going, they're, you're, again, you're going to have them everywhere. Good. Well, that's positive news for uh, yeah. this person. <laughs> the seeds are available. The Xerces Society, I believe, has um, them for sale at times, and then they have a few links where you can go to buy them. Um, monarchwatch.org they have them available and they also have some links to other places yes the prairie moon and prairie nurseries uh, .com, they also have the milkweed seeds that that are the native um 
sometimes you have to stratify those. They're not generally ready to plant, but they give you instructions on how to do that. And monarch, monarchwatch.org actually has a really good children's section for that to teach children and have some, has some really good resources for, for, uh, for kids. I will interject that one, one of the things you can do to collect seeds on, I would say probably in the Northern, on I-75, as you're going through McMinn County and into Monroe County, they do generally, I see a lot of milkweed growing in the median and on the side of the highway. Now you can't take the plants cause that's illegal, but you can go back if you're brave enough and collect the seed pods off those plants, which I have done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt that. <laughs> so, you know, um, you got to kind of time it right. Cause if you don't get there fast enough, the mowers will come by and wipe them all out. So it's kind of tricky, but that's also an interesting source for seeds. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to share this information and get more people on board with this. They really do. They really do. And when you're helping the monarchs, you're also helping all the rest of the butterflies and all the rest of the bees and everything else. It all ties together. So Linda, did you say that all the monarchs migrate to Mexico or just certain generations or some of them? It, it's a generational migration. So the first set makes it to about upper Texas and they lay eggs and then that group fly uh, matures and they fly a little further up to like our area. Then we're, we're having monarchs grow and then that set of butterflies makes it up. So you've got about three generations during that migration. That's how that works. It's not a complete, you don't have one butterfly leaving Mexico and flying to Canada. There's, mm -hmm. there's a generational migration going on. Awesome. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up. We just have more people saying thank you and great info and you know, love the presentation. So <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm so pleased that I could do this today. Yeah. Thanks again, Linda. Very thank good. you. That was an inspiration for any other master gardeners or folks who would like to make another lunch and learn. We're always looking for great speakers. All right. Well, everyone, I hope you have a great rest of your week. We look forward to next time. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah.